The drill we did in 1987 was our first attempt at an airport disaster drill in several years. It was a simulated air crash. Basically, we had a passenger aircraft commercial flight with about 150 people on board that came into the airport, had a problem, crashed on impact. My commander wanted me to get involved in the drill because he knew that if we had a major accident or a major incident at the airport, that we would be involved. And he wanted to be sure we had a coordinated effort when that happened. You are going to have a disaster in your community. You just don't know when or where it's going to happen. We got the whole community involved. You know, we got the school kids, we got the hospitals, we got the nurses, and we got the firefighters. We made it uh, a complete day out of it. Videotaping the drills is a great resource for us. It's a great training tool. One of my bosses basically told me that he could never imagine this kind of a problem really happening. Well, it happens somewhere else. It happens in Chicago, it happens in LA, it happens in Texas, but it doesn't happen in Sioux City, Iowa. Why waste the time? Well, two years later, this drill paid off in spades. Sioux City got a birthday for you. All right. Uh, I got a United Aircraft coming in, lost number two engine. When this call came in, I'd only been a fully qualified controller for three months. He was about 35, 40 miles from the airport, and that's when he told me how severe the problems were. So you know we have almost no controllability. I mean, we can only turn right, we can't turn left. United 232 Heavy, uh, understand, sir. Uh, you can only make right turns. That's affirmative. And I knew that it was not a normal situation because DC-10s normally don't land here. And so we responded to our standby position. We just don't know where they're going to come in at, so we're trying to keep you advised. This is what we've been training for. Now we're going to see if this training is going to work. We have no hydraulic fluid. I have serious doubts about making the airport. Have you got uh, some place near there uh, that we might be able to ditch? And as we get control of this airplane, we're going to put it down wherever it happens to be. When the engine was disabled, a part of it had severed, had cut a hydraulic line. He was losing 500 feet a minute, couldn't hold altitude at all. So unless he got control of the aircraft, there was no way he'd make it to the airport. Command United 232, have it did you get the souls on board, Count? I'll tell you right now, we don't even have time to let go to call the gal. Uh, Roger. Uh, 292. I might sound calm on the radio, but off the air. I was telling the people in the tire, you know, 300 people are going to die, and, and there's nothing we can do. My wife, Francie, and two of my sons, Brandon and Spencer, were on United 232 en route to a family reunion where my third son, Trent, and I were going to meet them. I was on the plane that day with my brother and two nephews. We had just gotten done visiting my sister and her children, and I was just looking forward to enjoying the rest of the summer. My boss and best friend uh, Jay and I weren't even supposed to be on United Airlines Flight 232. We were scheduled to take off four flights before that to Chicago. Got on standby and finally got on 232. We were the last two people to get on the plane. He was in row 30, I was in 23. And all of a sudden we heard this big explosion and I thought for sure it was a bomb or something. I was really scared. The captain came on the intercom system and said, we have had trouble with our number two engine, and we're going to shut it down. The thing that really made me nervous wasn't so much as the captain, but you could see the look on the stewardess' face. I mean, you just, they were just pale, and it was just hard for them to hide their fear. United 232 Heavy, you're gonna have to widen out uh, to make the turn on and off, so they'll take you away from the city. Whatever you do, keep us away from the city. Yeah, if you can't make the airport, sir, there is an interstate that runs uh, north to south of the airport. Uh, we're just passing it right now. We're going to crack the airport. United 232, happy roger. And I'm about to get the airport tonight. Get the runway in sight. We'll be with you very shortly. Thanks a lot for your help. Everyone in the tower thought that he really had it wired. You're cleared to land on any runway. <laughs> Do you want to be particular and make it a runway, huh? You know, I knew that without the hydraulics, He'd land fast, but it was like, you know, we'd witnessed a miracle. The 
captain got back on the speaker system and said, all right, brace, brace, brace. And everybody got to the crouched position that we had been informed to get into. And I told my brother that we better each take a nephew to be responsible for in case something happens. We watched him come in. He was nose up, his wheels were down, he was level. Most of us, I think, probably felt the aircraft would land. Uh, he'd roll out the other end of the runway, we'd evacuate the aircraft, and we'd all be home in time for supper. Plane 19, he's coming down real fast on the south end. I just turned away and kneeled because it was like getting your heart ripped out. I compared it to being in like a washer, that we were just spun around and around and around, and all these things were hitting me, and I was trying to hold on so tight, but the force just made my head keep coming, popping up and popping up and popping up. It looked like an atomic explosion with paper and money and magazines just floating in the air. Ironically, the crash happened at the exact same runway, the exact same spot where we had done the drill. So we'd all done this before. It was the most traumatic situation that I'd ever been involved in. We couldn't imagine that anyone could survive. I mean, it just looked like the plane had totally disintegrated. When we seen the first survivor, we just couldn't believe it, that someone had survived that. And then we seen more and more and more and more. When we stopped, we were upside down. I was still strapped in my seat. Um, and I had to stop and figure out if I was still alive. I remember thinking to myself, I've survived this crash. Now I'm going to burn up or I'm going to uh, suffocate because of the smoke. That scene with the smoke and the fire and all the devastation and the pain and the death is one that I just can't get out of my head. My eyes were swollen and my hand was broke and I was bleeding everywhere. But I knew it was more important that I get out and not worry about those things. In the midst of all this, I saw a female airman uh, carrying a small child that she had taken from the wreckage. I turned around and went to her, and she literally put a small child in my arms. He was not moving. I didn't know if he was dead or alive at that point. And I ran and rushed him into the ambulance. As it turns out, there was a picture taken during that time that was seen all over the world, and I had absolutely no idea that it was even taken. I called and called to Sioux City Hospitals to find out if anybody knew anything about my family on that flight. I thought everyone was dead. I first saw the photo of Colonel Nelson carrying Spencer while waiting for a connecting flight to Omaha en route to Sioux City. And at that time, I had to believe that he was alive. I found out that uh, the small child Spencer had in fact lived, and I was happy to, to hear that. He also had a, uh, a brother on the aircraft, uh, Brandon, who uh, also lived. Uh, uh, tragically, their mother, who was sitting between the two the children, uh, died in the mishap. I heard the stewardess say, unfasten your seatbelts and get out, unfasten your seatbelts and get out, and she repeated that and repeated that. Thank goodness, because it takes you a while to to focus and to really think of what, you know, what's going on here and that you do need to get out. I was getting ready to sprint away from the plane and just really taking my first step and I heard a baby crying. So I just made uh, a decision to go back in the plane to see if I could find this child. So I got down and uh, followed the cries through the smoke and just got right over top of the baby. She continued to cry pulled the debris away as she was just buried, reached down and just grabbed this crying baby and stood up and ran out of the plane. I 
away from the plane, I, I stopped and just kind of held her out in front of me and looked at her to make she, sure she was all right. She had stopped crying. She looked fine. She had a little cut over her eye, and I think that's the only injury that she had. I got out of the plane, and finally we found my brother. When I found out we were all together, then I knew it was okay to cry. Of my family, I was the most injured. I spent eight days in the hospital. We took 196 people to two hospitals within 48 minutes. Uh, had it not been for some 40 communities sending over 80 pieces of emergency equipment, it wouldn't have went as well. Two days later after the crash, when there was no report of my best friend, Jay, on a hospital, we knew he was dead. I really, deep down inside, knew he was dead an hour after the crash, but I didn't want to believe it. There were 112 people who died that were not going to be with their families the next year for Christmas or for the 4th of July or for an anniversary or birthday. Uh, there were 184 people who survived that had, their lives had been changed forever, and our community would never be the same again. The heroes in this story are the pilots, the flight attendants, and the passengers. Actually, the rest of us were merely there doing our job, what we were trained to do, and what we were prepared to do. Flight 232 came to Sioux City that day and tested us, and thank God we were ready. I could never fly again. I saw too much. I look at life. And I think how lucky I am to be still alive. And I'm thankful for every day I have. I know now that the most important thing in life is a religious conviction and it's family. It's not money. It's being content. It's being happy. It's, it's loving the people that you're close to. Trent, you go in. You're going first. Spencer hey, second. This is going to be fun. Right. I have a daily existence that's very different now very strongly supported by seeing my three boys grow up happy, normal boys. And I have to say thanks to a community that gave its heart and soul to see that my family and others had lots to be thankful for out of a very, very violent crash. This famous photograph has been immortalized on a plaque at the Sioux City Airport. And a fund drive is underway to commission a memorial that honors all the victims, survivors, and heroes involved with Flight 232. Eyewitness Video will be right back.